Let's look at deriving the Euler Lagrange equation analytically. Now this was a derivation that Joseph Lagrange came up with. So previous to this derivation, Euler had derived it, but he'd used a localized derivation. So f for the example of a hanging rope, if we were to imagine moving the rope from one position to another, we we're looking at the infinitesimal changes around some small section of that rope. So it was a very localized variation. But Lagrange decided to add a variation over the entire length of the extremum. So let's go ahead and we'll derive that now. So we have a y-axis and an x-axis. We start off with our original extremum y of x. So for example, this could be a hanging rope, in which case it would be hanging in, in an equilibrium position and it would be minimizing the gravitational potential energy. So we've seen previously that whenever we derive the Euler-Lagrange equation, we used the Euler's method in order to do that. And he looked at it in a very localized manner. So he thought about this, imagining taking one part of this extremum and just moving it and then checking to find all the changes that occurred. So that's a very localized derivation of the Euler-Lagrange equation. Now, Lagrange came along and he added the variation in over the entire length of the extremum. So let's go ahead and we'll see how we did that. So we introduced this function e to of x, which is in blue. He then multiplied that e to of x by some constant. So it's just a real number. He called it epsilon. So that means if you vary epsilon, we just change this function e to of x. And there you can see the family of functions being produced in the dotted curves. He then took this thing here, which he called a variation, and he added it onto the original extremum. And he got, finally got this pink curve here called y of x. So this large y of x here is the original extremum with a variation added. And we could see here that as this value of epsilon tends towards zero, this whole part of the function tends towards zero, and this value of y of x just tends towards small y of x. So we can see that large y of x and small y of x are different things. Large y of x is the original extremum plus a variation. And small y of x is just the original extremum. So we can also see here that the value of this function eta at a is going to equal 0. And eta at b is going to equal to 0 as well. We can also see that the derivative of a is going to be the derivative of b. And it's equal to 0 as well. Because outside here, there's just a value of 0. So we've seen then that the functional is written in the form the integral from a to b of f of x times y times y derivative. And we know that we choose y of x so that it ensures that the value of i is an extremum. But we also know now if we change this value epsilon, then if you think about it in terms of a, a rope, if we were to change the value of epsilon, it would change the, the actual position of the rope. So this would then for change the gravitational potential energy, or it would change the value of i. So it means that we can change this value of i by changing epsilon. So we can add on an extra factor, delta i. So we can say then that the whole point of this really is that we've now got a way of varying the functional. We can say that the functional is going to be a function of epsilon. And we can see here that our y of x equals small y of x plus epsilon eta of x. Our y derivative of x is equal to small y derivative of x plus epsilon eta of x. So we're going to use this here in order to derive the Euler-Lagrange equation. And this little addition here of this epsilon and creating a variation over the entire function is really the beginning of calculus of variations proper. So this is quite important and it's quite fundamental to the calculus of variation. So let's go and we'll look at it in the graphical calculator and it'll give you a better intuitive understanding of what's happening here. Let's look at the extremum in the graphical calculator. You have access to this file in the resources section, so you can go ahead and download that if you'd like to. So we introduce this function here, which is our y of x. So this is our original function. 
that we're going to use and it's in effect this is our extremum. So if we were to introduce two single points here, so we'll put a point at 2 and a point at 5 and we'll just draw the lines up until they connect. So this is going to be our A and our B. Then if we were to introduce the family of curves, so this is our eta of x, but we're going to have a family of curves. So what we do is we take this function eta of x and we multiply it by a value of epsilon. So here's our epsilon eta of x here. So that's just taking that eta of x and it's multiplying it by some number epsilon and you can see that is our family of curves. We then add this eta of x onto epsilon, the, the, we add this epsilon eta of x onto the y of x. So that's the addition there. And we get this y of x equals small y of x epsilon eta of x. And that's us adding a variation onto this extremum y of x. So whenever epsilon is equal to 0, we're just back to our original function. But whenever we change it, it adds on a variation. And you can see that quite clearly, the variation being added. So from the previous slide, we know that if we were to change the value of epsilon, then we change the value of i. So let's look at that in a bit more detail. So if we were to take the example of a hanging rope, we know that whenever the rope is hanging in its equilibrium position, the axis here i is given by the gravitational potential energy, and it turns out that the rope hangs in that shape in order to minimise this value. So it means that if we were to choose any other value for epsilon, so if we were to add any variation on, or equivalently were to change the shape of that rope, then this value for the gravitational potential energy, or I, would increase because we would have a, a local minimum whenever it's in a, an equilibrium position. But it doesn't necessarily have to have a, a local minimum. As long as the gradient here is a value of zero, then we have a local extremum. Now that extremum it may well be a local minimum, in the case of a hanging rope, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. It could be a local maximum, or it could be a point of inflection. So really, what we're interested in is looking at what happens to epsilon at this point whenever epsilon equals zero, because when epsilon equals zero, we know that we have an equilibrium position. So what we're interested in is the rate of change of the functional i with respect to epsilon at that point, epsilon equals zero. So writing that down mathematically, what we're interested in is the rate of change of i with respect to epsilon at epsilon equals zero. And we know that if it's in an equilibrium position, then that rate of change has to be equal to zero. So really, we can replace this value of i with our integral from a to b over f of x large y, large y derived of by dx. And that whole thing is going to equal to zero. So now we've got the problem of doing this differentiation. So how do we differentiate this functional here with respect to this value epsilon? So let's go and we'll have a look at that in the next slide. So let's see how we're going to differentiate a functional. We know that x is not a function of epsilon. x is an independent variable and epsilon is an independent variable. But y is a function of epsilon such that y of x is equal to small y of x plus epsilon eta of x. And we know that y derivative is a function of epsilon such that large y derivative of x equals small y derivative of x plus epsilon eta derivative of x. So if we were to try and generalize this a little bit more, we could say that we're going to have a function of y and y derivative, but we also know that large y of x is also going to be a function of epsilon 
and x such that it equals y of x plus epsilon eta of x and also y derivative of x is going to be a function of x and epsilon such that it equals y derivative of x plus epsilon eta derivative of x so let's write it out in this general form here in this blue box let's call this function f of y y derivative z and let's say at the next level we can say the function large y is some function g of epsilon and x in this instance this function g happens to be this here and also y derivative is also a function h of the independent variables epsilon and x in this instance h is the function in this form here so if we wanted to differentiate this z here with respect to epsilon then we would have to use the chain rule so z is this function f so we could simply write df by d epsilon is going to equal well at the top level you're going to have partial f by partial y and y derivative is held constant and the next level we're going to have partial y by partial epsilon and your x is held constant and that's going to be plus partial f by partial y derivative where your y is held constant and at the next level we're going to have partial y derivative by partial epsilon where your x is held constant so we want to apply this same setup here to our function our functional so the functional is of this form here where the y of x plus epsilon eta of x is this large y and y derived of x plus epsilon eta derived of x is this large y derivative so let's go ahead and we'll apply this here the chain rule for differentiation to the functional so applying what we've learned in the previous page we're going to differentiate our functional i with respect to epsilon so we're going to have our di by d epsilon and it'll be an integral from a to b of now using the chain rule which we've seen in the last page we're going to have partial f by partial y where y derivative is held constant times del partial y by partial epsilon where x is held constant plus partial f by partial y derivative where y is held constant times partial y derivative by partial epsilon where x is held constant and that's all by dx now what we're interested in now are these two terms here our partial y by partial epsilon and our partial y derivative by partial epsilon so let's go and we'll work these out just now now the partial y by partial epsilon where x is held constant well y is nothing other than small y of x plus epsilon eta of x so we have to differentiate this here with respect to epsilon so if we differentiate the first term here with respect to epsilon we'll get a value of zero because y of x is not a function of epsilon y of x is our original extremum now if we want to differentiate the second term here with respect to epsilon we're going to have to use the product rule for differentiation so we're differentiating the product of the two functions so what we can do is we can differentiate one multiply it by the other and then differentiate the second one and multiply it by the first so if we differentiate the first term here we're going to have partial epsilon by partial epsilon times the eta of x and the second term we're going to have our epsilon times our partial eta of x by partial epsilon now this first term here partial epsilon by partial epsilon is just a value of one so that's going to leave us with our eta of x now this term here partial eta of x by partial epsilon well our original family of curves we chose came from one value of eta of x and we, again we've already chosen that 
and we made that choice and that choice is independent of the value of epsilon so it means that the partial e to the x by partial epsilon is equal to zero because this e to the x is not a function of our epsilon so we're just going to be left with partial y by partial epsilon is equal to our eta of x. Now we can go through the exact same process with partial y derivative by partial epsilon and it's going to give us the value of eta derivative of x. So let's continue with this on the next page. So we're near the end of the derivation, not long to go now, so stick with it. So if we replace our partial y by partial epsilon with our eta of x, our partial y derivative by partial epsilon of our eta derivative of x, we get this equation here. But we know that we've got the differentiation here, so we know there's a limiting process here. So we really have a limit as epsilon tends towards zero. So in this instance here, as the limit as epsilon tends towards zero of our large y of x, it will tend towards small y of x and the large y derivative of x will tend towards the small derivative of x. So really all we're saying here is that this function y of x is the original extremum plus a variation. But whenever epsilon tends to zero, the variation just goes to zero and we're just back to our original extremum small y of x. So we know that if the rate of change of the functional with respect to epsilon is equal to zero, so this is just the functional here, and that's equal to zero. Then we can say that the value of i is an extremal. So it'll either be a local minimum, a local maximum, or a point of inflection. But the point is, is that in order for this to equal zero, something with inside this bracket must equal zero. Now we know that e to of x doesn't equal zero, because that's our original functions that we produce used in order to produce the variation. So that does not equal zero. So if we can take this eta of x out of the bracket, what is left over must be the thing that is equal to zero. But the problem is, is that we can take this eta of x out for this term here, quite simply, but we can't take the eta derivative of x out as well. So how are we going to do this? We're going to have to operate on this part of the function in order to allow us to get the eta of x out from this part of the function as well. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to use integration by parts, and we'll see that on the next slide. So this is the part of the derivation of the oil Lagrange equation that stumps most people or puts most people off. So let's take our time, we'll work through it, and I'll explain exactly what's happening. So we've seen in the previous slide that we wanted to take the function e to of x out and then we would have another section of the equation that would be left over. Now we wanted to do this because we know that e to of x doesn't equal zero. So that means that in order for this whole thing to equal zero, this other equation here, which I've just called left over, must be equal to zero. Now that might seem kind of obvious to you, but we will follow this up with the fundamental lemma of the calculus of variations, which really is a proof that if this e to of x doesn't equal zero, then this thing here must equal zero in order for this whole integral to be zero. So we'll get on to that in the next video. But for now, we were left with the problem here of this part of the equation. And we didn't want the eta derivative, we only want that to be a function eta. That would allow us to take this whole eta of x out. So how do we change this eta derivative just into eta? Well, we use the integration by parts. So integration by parts is like the product rule for differentiation. So we can call this the product rule for integration. So if we had two functions we wanted to multiply together and then integrate, we'll call the functions u and dv. Therefore, we can say that the integration by parts will give us u times v minus integral of v du. So the secret is choosing our values of u and dv 
So if we say that our dv is equal to the value eta derivative of x, so that means that whenever we integrate this side, we get v, integrate this side, we get back to eta of x. And if we say then our value of u is equal to partial f by partial y derivative, then we can differentiate both sides, in which case we get du is equal to d by dx of partial f by partial y derivative. So now what we do is we take these four terms and we put them in for our terms at this side of the equation. So our u times v is going to equal, well, our u is just going to be partial f by partial y derivative, and our v is going to equal the eta of x, and that's from a to b. And it's going to be minus the integral from a to b of our v times du. So v is our eta of x, that's it there, and du is d by dx partial f by partial y derivative. So right away you can see what's happened here. Get rid of that function to derive of x and replace it with a function of eta of x. But in doing so, we've taken the partial f by partial y derivative and placed it inside the differentiation. So that's really what integration by parts does here. It swaps around the sign for differentiation, so that no longer gets differentiated. This term here gets differentiated, so you can see they've swapped around the differentiation. So if there's any one uh, rule in uh, calculus you want to learn, it's really integration by parts. It's really useful, and you'll see it cropping up all over the place. So this first term here, we can see here that e to the a equals e to the b. Well, that is equal to zero. So that means that this whole term here is equal to zero. So we're just left with this term here. So we've got zero minus this function here. So this is really what we wanted to get to. We wanted to make sure that we no longer had this eta derived of x, we only have eta of x. So it allows us to take the complete eta of x out of the equation. So let's go and finish this off on the next page. So from the previous slide, we've seen that we can write partial f by partial y derivative times eta derivative of x in this form here eta of x d by dx partial f by partial y derivative. So this now allows us to take out the eta of x as a common factor. So what it le leaves is the partial f by partial y minus d by dx of partial f by partial y derivative. So we know that eta of x doesn't equal zero. So in order for this whole integral here to equal zero, the thing inside the bracket here must equal zero. And again, we'll cover that when we look at the fundamental lemma on the next video. So we're left with this identity, partial f by partial y minus d by dx of partial f by partial y derivative equals zero. And this is the Euler-Lagrange equation, which we've been deriving throughout the whole of the video. And this is Mr. Euler, and this is Mr. Lagrange. So what we've just seen is the analytic derivation produced by Lagrange. Now, it's said that Lagrange sent this derivation over to Euler, and Euler instantly recognised it as being a superior method. Euler's method is a, a localised method, and we're looking at the changes over a, an infinitesimal point. But the Lagrangian method introduced the idea of a variation, and the variation is over the entire length of the extremum. So if you want to really understand calculus of variations in its modern form, you have to understand the derivation by Lagrange, because this is the accepted normal derivation of today. But it's useful to look at the Euler's, Euler's uh, derivation, because it gives you a good intuition and a good lead-in to the analytic derivation of Lagrange. So that's all there is for this video. I hope it's been of value. I'll get you in the next video. Goodbye.